Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Yuri Wallach, my partner in crime as always, Vasily Gianna Rakos. My friend, how are you? Uh, doing really well. We're halfway through the week, so can't complain. Uh, in terms of hockey, there's just a lot of positives right now surrounding the Flyers, and I think that's almost a new thing for a lot of Flyers fans, mm-hmm. just if you consider... The last like they don't know how of, to handle it, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. If you consider the last couple of seasons, it's really been um, just a lot of negativity versus the positives. And even for us, right? Like we're usually, we try to keep things uh, in a realm where we're taking into account both sides of the coin. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, it can be easier, I would say, to talk about more positive things than, than it is negative. So it's it's a great thing all around. Yeah, no, I absolutely. I totally agree. Um, though... Large groups of people on Twitter. I do want to clarify that. Remember, Twitter is not a reflection of reality. I'll repeat that over and over and over again, though people don't seem to understand that sometimes. Um, don't see it that way. Um, but it's it's a good thing, and we're gonna talk a lot about that today. But before we get started, just want to give uh just want to remind everybody, please like and subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell. Uh, for notifications, um, and go to Spotify and iTunes um, to give us a follow there. And if you can rate us on iTunes, that is also extremely helpful. Again, all your guys' support has been amazing. Thank you so much. You see, we're trying to add like the post game episode, so we're going to start doing more of that. And remember that we're going to have Steve Cornianos back on here in about two weeks, two three weeks. What is that? Two weeks? I think the fifth. Yeah, right. It'll, it'll two episodes weeks. from now. Two episodes. Two two episodes after this, or yeah, two episodes after this, we're gonna have Mon, and that's gonna be all pro- prospects and whatnot. So we'll look forward to that one. Um, and also yeah. just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Jim Steaks on Fourth and South. Uh, you can get their steaks through DoorDash. Um, so if you're ordering a cheesesteak to go, remember to go to Jim Steaks and get yourself a cheesesteak. All right, let's get into it, dude. Um. Let's start off with this topic because I think this is the most fiery topic. We already kind of mentioned it already. The Philadelphia Flyers right now are in a playoff position. They are second in the division with a winning record. Um, they only hold that that position by one point. They have games in hand on their uh, competition. They are 10-7-1. Um, they have just beat the Columbus Blue Jackets. We did a post-game video on that. And you guys can check that out. Um, but they have a winning record. They have won five in a row. Um, and you know, they're about where we said they would be, which is there's st- because of the games in hand, I will say they still are a bubble playoff team. They have not solidified themselves as the top three team in this division, but you know, they're in that conversation with a five game win streak. Um, and you know, they might be better than what we think. And the, the question is, is this hurting their rebuild? It, is the ability to make the playoffs or fight for a playoffs hurting their rebuild? Now, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, a lot of people, and I, I mentioned this in the post game video, but I'm going to mention it again here. I, I think people's definition of a rebuild is completely incorrect. I, I think it's a very it, it's a very surface level analysis of what a rebuild is. People just want to see fancy names. Like we know the attention that Mitch Cobb gets. We know the attention that Cutter Gauthier gets, right? But again, I'm going to use the Boston Bruins as an example. You know, who's their number one center? I, I guarantee Zaka right now. Exactly. <laughs> now, there was a lot of conversation prior to this about will they take a step back? I didn't believe they would for the same reason why I think the Flyers are doing the right thing is they have a winning culture, they have a process and a level of standard that everyone must adhere to. This is also not the first year that they did this. If you guys don't remember, they lost, um, oh my God, uh, big guy. Please remind me of his name right now. Um, six uh, nine, Chara. Dan- so Dan Thank you. Is Dan Chara? I'm like thinking Zaka in my head. Uh, is Dan Chara? Left the team. They lost a bunch of defensemen. Called, you know, essentially had a bunch of guys who, you know, behind McAvoy, behind Carlo. Um, this is before they had Lindholm. You know, people expected them to take a step back. I actually made that incorrect assumption again. I've learned since then uh, that you know that they were going to take a step back. They never did. All those guys slotted right into positions and played well. 
Doesn't that look familiar to what you're seeing here? And I'll open up to you in a second here, Vasily, but I want to, I want to emphasize how important it is for this team to have a winning attitude and a winning mentality to be able to get the most out of what you have here. Think about how well these players are playing and how a lot of people assume that these players weren't good, how we weren't. Remember, we had a player development problem and we were wondering why the players here didn't turn out that this is the whole point is that this is improving, improving player development and to be honest with you, I think a lot of people undervalue the players on this team. I've been saying this for a few years. This has not been a talent issue why the Flyers ended up at the bottom of the league. It was a process execution issue. It has driven me nuts for years, just like I, I say that about the power play. I don't think the power play is a problem of talent either, at least not to be at the bottom of the league. You know, I think this team on paper is good enough to make the playoffs. They are not good enough to win a Stanley Cup, at least from the way they are right now. Having said that, this is a young team. People want to think 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. They don't play in the NHL. 21-year-olds, they don't play in the NHL. You are looking at the one percentage of the league. When you see a guy come into the league at 19, like Travis Konechny, look at what he's doing. He is a one percenter in the NHL. He is in the upper echelon of players. That is not normal. Majority of players come in mid-20s, and really that's where they start building their game at the NHL level. They touch the ice maybe at 21, 22. There's some, a lot cycle up and down. It's an up and down journey, and a lot of people are really upset. There, I, I saw even tweets of barren uh, farm system talk. Oh, it, it, that's absolutely untrue. Uh, and realistically, with Mitch Cobb, with Cutter Gauthier, your offense has elite talent in it. And in Mitch Cobb's case, generational talent. We are lacking that number one surefire defenseman, but they don't really get drafted. One, in each draft. Two, they're not a guarantee at the top of the draft. I can name you several I can go on list and list of defensemen who were taken in the top 10 that did not end up being number one defenseman in the league or even top two or three defensemen in the league. It happens all the time. One of them played here, Luke Shen, right? Uh, this happens all the time. You build defensemen internally. That is what happens majority of the time, and sometimes you get lucky and get an elite defenseman. That's what the Flyers are still missing is another top defenseman, a young guy, that is absolutely possible. Vasily, I'll leave you to that to the draft pick comments because I know you're going to say it. And just to remind everybody. But I think that it's really important to understand that what is happening here is absolutely the right thing. This team needs to learn to win. It, it increases the value of the players here. Then when we need to make trades, we can get move on from guys and then bring in replacements to fill our needs. Maybe find somebody else to play with Sandheim if we have to. Maybe York is that guy. Again, Risto hasn't even played a game. We'll talk about him. But I'm going to open up to you right now, Vasil. I'm sorry, I've been ranting. But I think it's very important to remember that this is the rebuild process. It's not a surface level, oh, we lose for several years, accumulate a bunch of picks, and then our organization magically turns around. Only three organizations who have tanked over the years have resulted into dynasties or championships. The rest have failed or sat in mediocrity. If in fact, if you look at majority of the best teams in the league, they never tanked ever. And how many people expect the Vancouver to be as good as they were? How many years did they, were they the worst team in the league in a, in a row? That's not how you build a team. I'm sorry. I, I don't agree with that. I don't even know how it got to that point where now this team is heading in the right direction. It's full of guys in their mid to lower 20s. They have rookies in the lineup. They have an AHL squad. We'll do an AHL update after this. They have, they have depth at all positions, and people are complaining with two superstars coming. And people are still going, oh, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. How do you know what's enough? Is every single person able to predict the Stanley Cup champions? I'll, I'll wait as people tell me who, that they knew Vegas was going to win the Stanley Cup last year. Go ahead, Vasily. You can add to that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think it's a great question to ask, obviously. Like, you're looking at a team that 
was etched in to be one of the bottom teams in the league by most um, national media pundits. I mean, that's not what we predicted. We essentially said that they were going to be a bubble team just based on the talent, based on the roster. Yep. Um, but national media isn't as keyed in to the Flyers specifically as we are because, I mean, they haven't been a good team for the last few years. And usually when you're not a good team, you're not going to be on the radar of a lot of national right. media. That's just essentially how it works. Um, no, but I'm okay with in- that. Yeah, exactly. But in terms of does winning hurt the Flyers and just their overall um, and overarching kind of view of where they're at as an organization, what they need to do, I don't think it does. But there's still aspects you have to take into account. Like, for example, right? I mean, you're a team that's winning right now. Should you trade your two first round picks, you know, this upcoming draft to try to add um, at the trade deadline? Probably Good not. Point. Like, that's not a move that you're going to want to make. Right. Um, but in vice versa, you know, not having that top 10 pick and, you know, continuing, let's say, to lose um, and let's say look at other teams that have done it in the past. Right. Like look at an Edmonton. Look at all the top number one picks that they've had. Are they have they been any closer to a Stanley Cup in the last decade? I mean, not really. Obviously, you still have two of the, two of the best players in McDavid and Dryside. are rumored to want to leave. Well, yeah, exactly. Who knows about that? But it's definitely possible. It. Yeah, it's I definitely it. a possibility, but who knows? Um, but even look at Buffalo. I mean, look at Colorado. Like the Sabres are just now entering a territory of being a wild card team after years and years of tanking and kind of being at the bottom of the barrel. Colorado took them almost, you know, a decade as well. Um essentially to kind of build this team up to, from the bottom to eventually win a Stanley Cup. So I think what people need to understand is there's multiple ways of building a successful NHL franchise and organization. Not to say that tanking and losing can't work because, you know, multiple ta- top 10 picks and multiple picks um, can be a real tool to use to build your team and uh, get to the level that you want them to get to in terms of, you know, elite talent uh, contending, you know, for a Stanley cup, things like that, but it's not the only way to do so. So in a sense, I think probably the flyers actually being more competitive this season does them more of a benefit just in terms of the young assets they have on the roster. Like there's a lot of guys and we mentioned this, you know, in our post game show as well, a a lot of guys that are still 26, 25 years old and under that are on this team. um, How does losing every single night benefit their development and their progression as NHL players and even their value as assets? It doesn't really, what it does is diminish them in a lot of different areas. And like you said, it makes it harder to make a deal down the line for some of these players. If you're looking to add, but also what I think it does too, is it muddies the waters as to what do you really have here to work with? What do you really have as a team? Right. Like you're looking at the Flyers now, they have a cohesive um, system on the ice. You know, they're playing well. You can easily pinpoint and say, well, okay, so this is what we have. This is where we need to add in terms of, you know, certain areas on offense, certain areas on defense, um, certain areas to special teams. If you have a team that's a straight up dumpster fire, how do you accurately depict, okay, so who do we need to keep and who do we need to get rid of? It's, It's hard, right? And I think that was... Um, a big kind of indicator into why Tortorella got brought in. So we could kind of identify that. And then you work from there. Um, Do they look like they're a little bit ahead of schedule right now? Uh, I would say yes, but we have to understand this is the highs of highs that they're at right now. Um, We can't expect them to stay at this level the whole season. So I would say people, you know, temper your results and your expectations. The the people that want losses, they're going to come. Is it a bad thing for them that, they're not going to have a top 10 pick here. I would say no. And the reason is you already have a Matt V. Mitchkov and you already have a cutter go to, you already had two seasons of your team finishing in the bottom 10 of the NHL to accumulate these skilled types of players and skilled types of picks, right? Like if the flyers, for example, let's say finish in, you know, the, the muddy middle between 10 and 20 in the draft. And let's say their draft picks that they were banking on kind of making an impact going forward weren't as um, set in stone in terms of being top line level talents. Then I would say, okay, the team does need a top 10 pick here. They do need to add that type of talent, but with, with guys that are projecting to be as good as Mitchkov and Gauthier are, I don't think it's as much of an issue, especially too, when you have two first round picks this upcoming um, off season and you can actually potentially use those to maybe move up into the top 10, um, depending on where they lie. Right. So there's always different things you can do, but for the players that are on the team, 
for them to actively be trying to lose or for the team to actively be trying to lose here and not, um, you know, work towards a cohesive goal, work towards getting better and then just being really bad and tanking. That does nothing for any of the players on this team right now uh, in terms of them becoming better players and in terms of them learning how to win and learning how, um, you know, to play in certain situations in the NHL. Like you have a handful of young guys like, a you know, Owen Tippett, like a Morgan Frost, like a Bobby Brink, like a Cam York, like an Igor Zamula, um, like a Tyson Forster. Do you want their first introduction to the NHL to be constant losing and kind of a constant mess of, okay, you know, what is happening with this team? Is there any actually structure or cohesion at all? Like that's not um, the right environment for your young players to come up and be developed in. And you could see that hurt um, players and, and um, their ability to be, you know, impact players later on in their career. So I think rebuilds. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Like, having too much of a losing culture is not a good thing as well. Like you want to get your picks, but you want these kids to be surrounded by, you know, veterans like the Flyers have like a Katuri, like an Atkinson. So I, I don't see the point in stripping it to the bone and going full tank mode and just, you know, straight losses because we've seen in the past how that can actually um, be a negative to the younger players you start to bring in because there's nothing around them that can help them acclimate to the NHL level. Uh, so that's why I think the way the Flyers are doing it in this situation is actually actually a smart thing. Um, and it really hinges on the fact they have Gauthier and Mitchkov that are still not even added to this roster. So you still have those young guys you can bring along with that elite level pedigree. Whereas I think in the past, if you look at the Flyers, you know, the Hextall rebuild, because um, that was a rebuild, right? You brought in young guys like Konechny, like Patrick, like failed. Provorov. And it failed, exactly. So that's another thing to point out. But... W- my thing is, I think um, the ceiling of these guys, like a Mitchkov, like a Gautier, are higher than, you know, what a Patrick, what especially a Provorov. Mitchkov. Yes. Yeah, especially Mitchkov. Like, if you look at, you know, Patrick's ceiling, he was thought to be, okay, a decent first-line center, and that was a second overall pick. That was just a, a weak draft in general. Yeah. Um, obviously, you get Kale McCarr and Elias Pettersson, but they were never prognosticated to be as good as they've turned and out Heiskanen. to be. And Heiskanen as well, yeah. Um, whereas you know Mitchkov, sure. just just look at the um, just look at the point production that he's putting up. It's better than you know um, some generational talents that have made their way to the NHL, like Kucherov, like Ovechkin, and other players. So I think in terms of where the Flyers are, in terms of the winning, it's really not a bad thing at all. Um, and the first thing is they're not going to keep uh, winning at the level they have been, right? They're going to kind of fall back down to being into that bubble area. I don't expect them to keep a top three spot in the Metropolitan Division here just with the games in hand other teams have. But for them to actually actively be in a situation where games matter later on in the season, that's good for these younger players because would you rather have your younger guys developing in a situation where come January, while the games don't matter anymore because we're so far behind the standings, um, we're not going to have any chance of even sniffing the playoffs? Or would you rather have players um, playing against teams in meaningful games where things are on the line, where there's actually legitimate pressure on them to perform? That's how you can actually... First off, um, have a player learn in those situations. But secondly, too, um, have a player um, understand how to perform in those situations, too, right? Because if you're not able to actually be in it, how do you know how they're going to react or if that's a guy you might want to move forward with? I think it's a good thing for their long-term development because you can assess and say, well, look at how this guy or this particular player performs under this scenario, under the situation when they, it really counts in the chips on the table. That's how you can make um, your valid assessments. And without that, it's hard to simulate. So I think just from a development standpoint in a lot of different areas, it's a, it's a helpful thing that they're not you know, actively a bottom five team right now. Yeah, no, I think that's very well said. Um, I completely agree with everything you said there. Um, and and not only that, like I we I, I talked about this months ago. I, we both we were talking about this over the summer. The, I, I and I said this to you guys. You know, those who those of you who've been listening for a long time that this whole rebuild thing, the new you know Jones and and Briere, they'll say whatever they got to say to make the fan base feel better, right? They'll say rebuild. 
But at the end of the day, all of that is irrelevant. Rebuild, retool, none of that matters because what you do is address things as they come because you cannot predict the next several years. And, you know, Briere said himself, and I said this, we said this on the podcast, the players will decide when the rebuild is over, not when you accumulated a certain amount of picks. That's made up. That is just absolutely untrue. And look at the what is a retool? Like, and Vasily, you said it perfectly, right? They're not going out. They didn't pick up anybody. They picked up bottom six guys. Yeah. They didn't go out and get big names. If anything, like look at what the Rangers did. They wrote that letter to their fan base, right? They picked up Panera in the same year, and they had one top pick in Lafreniere. No, I'm sorry. They had two, Lafreniere and, and Capo. And then the, the rest was history, and they essentially just moved forward with their team. And look at that team today. They got Adam Fox in yeah. a trade. They didn't draft him. Right. It's like, could you have did, Do you think they plan that out step by step? We're going to tank for the next five no. years. They thought they would be worse. They exceeded their expectations and they built on it. And let me add one more thing and, I, and I'll let you respond here. Vasily. It's also not just the players on, you know, not just the forwards and the defensemen, the goaltenders. The Flyers have a bevy of young goaltenders, Hart, Airson, Vorobiev. Oh, I'm sorry, for OBF. Uh Kolosov, uh, even Matei Tomek to some degree. I don't know if he'll ever play over here, but he's doing well in Czechia. Uh Bjarnison and what's his uh Zver Zver Zvragan. Zvragan, or however you the hell you say his name. <laughs> Thank you. Uh Zvragan, who's killing it right now. These guys can't come into a messy environment. That's a great way to destroy their confidence. We need to build on that. We want the goalies to stay here, knowing that they can have good numbers in front of yeah. our D and the way we we block shots and the way we get in front of everything and the way we, we win. They want to win. Players want to win. Players want to win. They don't want to lose. We have to create a winning environment. I think you said it very well, Vasily. But that's for any young player, right? You don't want them to really come into an environment that's in shambles. All that's going to do is... Um, kind of did to that. Their, yeah, to kind of lead to their confidence uh, potentially diminishing and them not developing in the right way that they should. But I think the Rangers point is really great that if you look at how they kind of did it, um, it wasn't just, okay, one mindset, we have to rebuild. That means we have to suck and we have to just draft in the top 10 for the next five years. And that's how we're going to get good again. I think you have to be careful when you're managing a hockey team, when you're building a hockey team, because you can get too linear focus on one particular mindset to build your team the draft is one tool to use but it's not the end-all be-all and i think that there's a lot Very of well different said. there's a lot of different ways to um, put a team together a manufacture team and you have to be open to a lot of different scenarios i think maybe in the past the flyers were too one track focused on okay well how can we get better um, you know, we got to sign free agents. We got to try to make trades. And I think maybe they weren't as focused on the player development side of things and as focused on the draft. But with Briere and Co. and just the the way the regime is kind of laying things together, and they kind of built a, a whole different foundation with their player development staff here. So time will tell how those you know new hires kind of do in a player development role. But I think that they're a, a lot more open to looking at all different ways to get better. Yes. Um, whereas other management teams like Hextall, like Fletcher might have been stuck in certain, uh, you know, mindsets, certain sects of kind of moving and looking to to make uh, different adjustments within the organization. I think the team really just needs to be open on all fronts in the sense, okay, how can we improve using the draft? How can we scour the trade market and improve that way? How can we utilize free agency? And also, how can we utilize the players we already have in our system um, first and foremost, to make our team better as well. So I think there's a lot of different aspects to kind of take into account. And that's what you have to remember. It's not just one thing. Like drafting in the top 10 uh, cons consistently isn't just going to magically make you a Stanley Cup contender. Like we said, look at the Buffalo Sabres, look at the Edmonton Oilers. They did it for years. Arizona and it hasn't Coyotes. worked. Arizona Coyotes is another great example of that too. Um, but yeah, so I, I think just really to sum it up on this conversation, Yareev, if you look at it, in tandem what the flyers are doing now it's a good mix of everything right like right. they have they have exactly 
um, high end guys in Goti and Mitchkov that are eventually going to be here that you need to potentially take the next le- next step and go to that next level. But they also have a surrounding core that's already here, and they have a culture that's being kind of fostered and developed by John Tortorella that's going to welcome guys like that and welcome any younger guys that they do want to kind of bring into the fold here, uh, and it'll help their development path. So I think they're in a good spot right now. It'll be interesting to see how they proceed, but Briere, I think he's kind of setting them up for um, you know being able to add in the right spots because where they're missing first line center right now I mean Chuck Couturier is a first line center but I'm saying down the line maybe four or five years from now who knows if Cutter Gauthier projects to be that and a number one defenseman but you're going into next offseason the next couple of offseasons with a lot of cap space free um, and you have all your first round picks so there's a lot of things that you can do with first 100%. round picks either either make those draft picks, make trades with those picks potentially to get better in those areas, and, or use the cap space in free agency. So they're not handcuffed. If you look into the future, they're not handcuffed in a lot of different facets where if you look under you know, the Hextall era, the Briere era, there were, or not Briere, the Fletcher era, there were a lot of areas where you said, okay, like where can they make moves? They can't, right? right. I think that's a lot of the process that we kind of can't, forget that Briere's made moves this past off season that are going to set them up for future success. So, yeah, no, I think that was a perfect way to add to that. And there, there are so many moves that are going to be available. This team, the cap is, is going to go up. And, and again, like facility said, if things balance out and the flyers are clearly out of a playoff spot, right. With, you know, 50 games into the season and uh, things are falling apart and they're kind of middling or They'll they're in that, like 20, they will sell. That we don't know what they'll sell. Maybe Cam Atkinson's that guy that yeah. moves. We don't know exactly. You but know? I wouldn't expect them to buy here. Like I don't think they're gonna right. they're exactly. gonna go out and add to this team it, unless and it's a you, young player. Yeah, I can see exactly. them doing that, makes that sense down the line. But I'm saying they're not gonna go and be like, okay, give me this veteran, give me this veteran, give me this veteran. No, it would, right? It would be a hockey trade, like young guy for a young guy or veteran like a for a young guy. Like let's say hypothetically. Because Morgan Frost is a hot topic. Obviously, it doesn't look like he has a cemented place in this lineup right now on a regular basis. If you're Danny Breer at the deadline, you trade him for a struggling defenseman who's also a similar age. Maybe they could use a young defenseman more. They could use a forward. Sure. That could make sense, right? Like, yeah, or a it's pick. Not all, yeah, exactly, right? Like, it's all. It's not all, okay, just because you're rebuilding, well, now... Well, uh, we can only pick in the top 10 in the draft the next five seasons, and we're not allowed to trade for any players that are going to help our team, and we're not allowed to do this and that. There's no rules to this, right? You have to look at every um, situation that comes your way and assess it appropriately. You can't just make brash decisions based on one overarching theme of rebuild. Yeah. The one thing I, I, I can understand why people are getting frustrated and you know, you mentioned the frost thing. I was going to bring it up a little bit later, but it's perfect that we just talk about it now. You know, I understand that. You know, you see a guy like Deloria in the lineup, you know, and you're like, we talked about it on here. Ideally, sure, we want frost in there to be a regular and we want Deloria to be the guy. I, maybe that'll happen in the second half of the year. I, I don't know. Right. It'll but it'll be an injury that allows but, it to But happen. you're also, you're also picking on one decision. Yeah. And you look at all of the young guys who are coming in and it's not going to stop. And again, if they're fighting for a playoff spot, you can't expect the coach to be like, oh, well, I guess let me just throw in the guys who make mistakes. Right. Like he wants to be in the playoffs, too. That is what is good. And don't forget about money. Playoffs make you money. It also attracts free agents. Right. So even if you want to find a younger free agent who's 25, maybe you want to find that 25 year old guy maybe you can trade for him and he actually wants to be here right like all of that matters and i i love the way you put it vasily it's you really just need to look at all avenues available for you and you have to be a creative gm an aggressive and creative gm and you have to go out and get guys like i i talked about getting jack eichel be afraid to make moves right like i talked about getting a guy like jack eichel like look at what vegas did they saw a young talented center who was in his early 20s who was available for a trade that stuff happens more often than it should quite yeah. frankly but there, are like there are players who will have to leave town there are teams that will try to get additional assets try to get a first round well, pick we might be able to leverage our first round picks for that for a guy who's 22 years old 23 24 right and then they can be here for a decade go ahead Vasily. Yeah, that's my point. Like, I think, at least from the prior conversation, and then we can get into Frost a bit, um, that, 
you know, the, the prior Flyers management, I, I just think they did not take advantage of those opportunities. Like, they probably could have traded for Eichel. The Flyers had the assets to do so at that point. They just chose not to do it. And where would the team be and what kind of mode would they be in now if they had a player like that? Who knows, right? But if you're afraid to make those moves when the opportunities arise, um, it's just going to be a negative thing for you. And I think Briere is a GM just from this past offseason. We've seen that he's not afraid to be aggressive and make the move um, you know, that might benefit the team in a positive way in the future. And I think that's something that they've been lacking just with the last two GMs and kind of the moves that they've made. Because I don't think there was really one splash move that either Hextall or Fletcher really made that you could point to and say, oh, that's a big blockbuster trade, right? Whereas Briere, I mean, the first trade he makes with Provorov is a kind of a big blockbuster type of move and type of deal that you typically didn't see the other GMs make here. But in terms of Morgan Frost and kind of where he's at and just the fact that he's flip-flopping, you know, in and out of the lineup here, uh, he's not going to play uh, in this upcoming um, game against the Islanders. Uh, if you look at the pr- at, or uh, at the practice kind of rotations, he was rotating in and out um, as a 13th forward. So that kind of indicates that he'll be the odd man out. And, and we'll get into the lineup um, from practice as well. It's pretty similar to what it's been in the last uh, five games here, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but just for him in general, I mean, he has four points in the last four games, so he's doing his part. I just think um, if you look at what he's good at and what this team needs, it's not enough for Torrell to have him be an everyday lineup player, and he's explained it multiple times. Whereas, okay, if we want Frost to be in there every night, he needs to be an offensive contributor in the top contributor on the top two lines and produce offensively i think four points in four games isn't enough for what tortorella wants unfortunately i think he wants him to be a catalyst well, in terms of creating you know offensive opportunities things like that on a nightly basis where as soon as he first got back in after the the prior scratching he was looking like that but he's tailed off a couple games and then that's when you see a brink come in brought, i think he, you you he brought up more the of Vegas a consistency game. exactly you brought up yeah. the, the vegas game i'm sorry to cut you off but you brought up the vegas um the vegas game where he did struggle a little bit. I mean, completely takes a penalty off. late. Yeah, yeah, and I think exactly. I, I think Torts recognizes he has too many players, and he's looking for reasons to bench, especially younger guys, right? And he focuses more on defense. This is the defense first team. People cannot like that, but look at the type of centermen that are out there. Look at the type of defensemen that are playing. You know, in the lineup, who get more of the ice time. They're guys who. But if yeah. they are physical and block shots, right? that's what like, I mean, right? There's guys like a Cates, like a Paling that he's battling with because those, those are the centers. So I'm that's what I'm going to use as a reference point. Like you mm-hmm. could say it's Brink for Frost all you want, but they do not play the same role. So they're not interchangeable like you think, right? Yeah. Like it and matters. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it matters what you know. Paling and Brink, or not Brink, Paling and Cates are doing um, in terms of their positioning in the lineup. So I think for Frost, if you look at those two guys, right? Okay, Paling's in, Cates is in. Do we see any limit in terms of the offense of the team with Frost out and those two in? No, and they bring more of a defensive acumen, right? So it makes sense as to why the coach is going to say, "Well, let me go with what I know that's going to be more safer defensively," and also give some of an offensive punch. And, and you and you can't um, deny the fact that Ryan Paling's been producing offensively. He has just as much points that, or just as many points as Frost has here. So yes. you can't deny that fact, um, even though for some reason, you know, Paling is the guy within the kind of fan base and just within the general discourse that seems to want to be the odd man out, but he's playing well. So it makes sense. I think for Frost, really, it's just long-term fit. Like, look at it down the line here. If Cutter Gauthier is coming to this team in, a, in you know, end of March, beginning of March, hypothetically, that adds even more uh, muddiness to this roster. Like, where is he going to fit, right? Like, there's just not enough room, not enough space. So, at this point, like, it sucks to say, but, like, my perspective on Frost is he's likely going to be the odd man out here uh, going forward. That's kind of my opinion. I I just think even no matter what he does, like, if he gets back in the lineup on an everyday basis and kind of, like, proves, okay, I'm a 50, 60, 70 point guy just based on like points per game at this, at this stage, let's say he, he get in, he gets in like due to an injury or something like that. Maybe he cements himself that way, but I just look at the long-term fit and I don't know if there's really a place for him down the line. So it makes sense why they're using him in this manner, because I think the other guys they view as, okay, we could use these guys long-term versus Frost. I don't think that they're 
kind of looking at it that, yeah. that way. And more. and maybe some of that's not fair to him too. Like I heard Bill mention Bill Meltzer mention this that there's a little bit of a double standard, and I do see that. You know, I, is, I'm not definitely. I'm I'm not happy with it. You know, but and then I see Forrester not getting sat without the offensive production. But I'll say this about Forrester: as far as the physicality, the shot blocking, the digging in the corners, the board battles, yeah, he's better than Frost at that. Okay, so and, and again, the four this, checking, so. and this is what our coach is looking for. You have to recognize that he plays a certain style. His team plays. He even talked about Nick Sealer and how Nick Sealer plays his style. He, it's what he's looking for in a player. That doesn't mean that Frost doesn't have value in the NHL. and doesn't mean another team can't look at him and be like, well, we need that type of guy or our coach prefers that type of guy or whatever. But again, you just have to be realistic with the coaches you have here. You have a defensive first team and, you know, he's seeing the brunt end of it. I think he can still get out of it. I, I think there is a, a little bit of a double standard, but there's also that consistency of, hey, the team played really well. I don't want to mess with the lineup. And then when they do lose or lose a, an inch, Somebody gets um wait you know kind of taken out. The only thing is I I I will say I'd love to see Deloria fall under that the guy who plays the least amount of minutes you know and I think he does you know Torres has a veteran bias like every other coach in the NHL in the whole league yeah. right so again the the a lot of the guys who are around 29, 28, 30, 31, 32 they get some exemptions. You know, and there's not a lot of those guys on that team, so of course, are on this team, Exa so of course, exactly. he's going to say, "Well, we already have so many young players, and I want to keep one of these veterans in," and that it factors into it too. Exactly. Uh, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I I still, again, if you're asking if you're asking the both of us, we're both going to tell you that we see Frost in this middle six position. Yeah, here on I think one he of these play lines. Here. Yeah, and and we but, see Del Delorier sitting, but. I'm just looking at from the coach's perspective, from the organization's perspective, you can kind of just see the writing is on the wall, just based on the usage and how yeah. it's kind of going right now. Unfortunately. I, I don't have it. I don't have any disagreement. And and at a certain point, it's like, we'll see where this team is. We'll see what the injuries are like. We'll see what kind of assets they need, what kind of trades are available. You know, all of this is part of that rebuild process. So, all right, let's, let's get into our next uh, topic. So flyers are going for six, Six in a row. Uh, they they beat Columbus. And I, I would say a game they definitely look like they were the better team. But Columbus did put, put up a good fight. Um, Flyers win five in a row. And now they, they're going to have a, a team that's somewhat struggling. Um, but not struggling too badly. Uh, they're, they lost a lot of games in overtime. Um, they have 17 points. or six, six, and five. The New York Islanders, who is a team that we definitely struggle playing against at times. Um, they are a defensive first team, at least GM down. Um, and, you know, most of Lou Lamorello's teams are a defense first team. This is a team yeah. that probably will match up well against the Flyers. It's going to be a good test for them. It's not going to be, there are no easy games for the Flyers, in my opinion. Um, I don't really think there's easy games in the NHL, but, you know, there's teams that the Flyers One match up better. One of the most parity driven leads, I would say. So. Exactly. There, we saw even with San Jose, there, there are no easy wins. Um, but this is going to be a tougher game for the Flyers. They've already won five in a row, so they're going to go in. Let's just go through those lines that um, that you mentioned, Vasily. I'll go through them real quickly, and then we can talk about like the lineup and how we think we're going to do. Uh, so the top line is uh, still Forrester, Coots, TK. Second line, Tippett, Lawton, Atkinson. Third line, Farabee, Paling, Brink. Fourth line, Delorier, Cates, Hathaway. Realistically, probably not going to be any changes there between the practice today and the game tomorrow, or as you're listening to this, the game tonight. Um, Travis Sanheim, York, top pairing, Sealer, Walker. Um, and then the one change that we potentially will see, though this is not final, um, it will be Stahl and Zamula as the bottom pairing. I do suspect that this will be the case. I do suspect Belpedio will sit there um, and they'll want to get Stahl into a game. I think. Uh, Belpio has played really well. I'm not knocking him, but it, again, the lowest played def uh, defenseman on the team. Um, and I, and you know, they really like stall. He also brings a lot more size than Belpedio. Uh, he's a, he's a much bigger body and you put a veteran like that with years of experience who does really well at getting other defensemen to play better. Um, putting him with Zamula, I think is a really nice idea. Um, and then also, uh, just to add that Rasmus Ristolainen uh, is also cleared for contact. 
So things get even more interesting with the D and we'll see what happens there. And I'm sure people will get pissed off as Zamula becomes the seventh defenseman there uh, and Stahl and Risto are pairing. But I suspect that Stahl will be rotated in in and out of the lineup and maybe the Flyers will go with a Zamula um, Risto pairing, um, you know, more, more, more games than a stall wrist line in or whatever happens with, you know, injuries and whatnot. But I, I think it's the first time that the flyers really are three pairings deep, uh, in a long time. Um, and again, these, everything might change, but I think suspecting that that's probably what we'll see. But what, what do you think about those lines? And what do you think about the flyers chances against the Islanders? Um, it's not uh, too surprising to see them go with essentially the same lineup that they had the other night. Um, I mean, maybe you could have looked and said, well, Brink goes in after a win. Why can't Frost go in? So that's a valid point. I, I understand that. But obviously, the coach values the defensive acumen that um, that center and, court. Without and the Islanders Frost. are a very right. physical team. I'm sorry to cut you off, but something to yeah. keep in mind. Yeah, exactly. Right. So the Islanders forecheck really hard. So. Maybe they don't think that Frost is going to be able to handle some of that defensive pressure they would put on him. So maybe that's why they want to go with a more defensive um, kind of centered uh, lineup. But if you look at it right, it's no surprise that Torch is a defense heavy first coach and their four centers are defense type first kind of centermen, right? Like look at Couturier, Lawton, Palin, Kate. So there's obviously a style that the coach is looking for down the middle here. Um, so that's not very much a surprise. Like we all know how George or how John Tortorella wants to kind of formulate his lineups here. Um, in terms of stall getting back in over Belpedio, I mean, I'd say that's pretty set in stone. You kind of look at the practicing and the way that was done and you have Belpedio practicing with Ristolainen on the extra pair there. So it makes sense. I'd imagine with Ristolainen kind of being in that, uh, you know, stage where he's just gotten cleared for contact. It'll be similar to Stahl where he might have a couple full practices and then he eventually gets in maybe this weekend coming up here um, in one of the back-to-back games. But who knows? Uh, I'm sure Risto is, is a lot closer though now, obviously. So it'll be interesting to see. I think that's where we're going we're gonna to probably see most of the changes coming up here on the defense. Uh, but there's no telling that Zamula is going to be the guy that comes out, right? Because he actually, after you know getting singled out a couple games ago and getting benched um, in that third period there, he bounced back with a couple of really good games um, against uh, Vegas and uh, Columbus. So it's not surprising um, that, you know, we see him kind of in the lineup and kind of working through his struggles. That's, I mean, the whole point of this type of season, right? To develop these younger guys and, okay, you made a mistake. Let's see how you go back out there and learn from that. That, um, and kind of perform in the same situation where that mistake occurred in the past. So I like the way they're handling it. Um, if, you know, Zamula is to come out, I think it's not the worst thing in the world because despite his size, he's not always the most physical guy and the Flyers defense does lack some physicality. So you get stall, you get wrist lining back in there. It does add to that. Um, the Islanders, it'll be interesting because they're on a bit of a slide here. So obviously they're looking to turn that around. Um, the Flyers, you know, are a divisional rival for them. So there's, you know, this is a four-point game here, right, on both ends. Um, so it's an important one. Um, I would say for the Flyers, they've kind of not let other teams dictate their style of play. They ha- they've been able to keep their structure the way that they play in most matchups this season. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, using the defense to outlet the puck up quickly, transition up the ice in a quick manner and be aggressive offensively and use the forecheck to kind of establish um, that offensive pressure throughout the game, along with just getting a lot of pucks on net. So that's kind of been the identity the team's played with. I think the Islanders try to slow the game down. So I'm interested to see if that affects the Flyers structure and affects their gameplay in this one coming up. Um, It hasn't for a lot of other teams and that's playing against really top tier teams like Vegas, Carolina, LA. Um, Even in the games that they lost to those teams, they still kept their style and their identity. So I don't imagine it would change against the Islanders, but they do play a different slow it down type of game. So I think that'll be a test for the Flyers here. I think maybe the Islanders might be a team that could give them some fits. So I'm kind of interested to see how they respond and uh, kind of play off the Islanders type of game. Um, For the Flyers, I think their keys will be similar, right? The Islanders try to slow it down. Well, play with a pace um, that kind of makes them more uncomfortable, right? The Flyers have been a a quick team this season, just in terms of the transition and kind of moving pucks up ice. So I think they'll want to continue to do that to have success here. 
Yeah, I think that was really well stated. And I, I suspect that it will give the Flyers fits. You know, you, you think about the way the Islanders play, the fact that they'll grind you down the corners. They're going to try to block a lot of the shots, right? They're, they're going to take the Flyers game right back to them. Um, and if the Flyers try to cheat and come in and be a high scoring team against them, I think they'll they'll struggle. But if they play their game the way they played against Vegas, the way they played against Carolina, the way like they that underdog mentality that they've had, they need to keep that because I think that's a big reason why they've done well. Um, and I don't think they can lose sight of that. So we have a note here about Joel Farabee's usage, and maybe this will be, you know, kind of aligned with what we're talking about here. So, you know, I do think the Flyers can win tomorrow. Um and I, I do think if they continue that, they'll they'll do that. But, you know, a guy that is, you know, really doing excellent, you know, right now and not getting a ton of ice time. I think, Vasily, did you say it was 13 and a half minutes of ice time he was getting? A game? Uh, so last game he had 12-24 specifically. Right. Uh, and he played really well so far this season. He has 15-12 time on ice per game. Okay, 15. Um, so which is not bad. It's it's decent, but if you look at the past couple of games, he's been getting like 13 minutes, 12 minutes, like 14 minutes below that 15 point mark. Um, that's been his average for the season. So I kind of wanted to bring this up as a topic just because you look at Farabee's play, um, and he's been one of the best players on the team, like in terms of point production. Uh, he has seven goals, seven assists, 14 points in 18 games played. Um, I have another really interesting stat here as well, um, from him. Uh, so in terms of 5.5 or 5.5, uh, in terms of five on five points per 60 uh, minutes among forwards with at least 220 minutes played this season, uh, Joel Farabee is second overall in the NHL. Uh, and that's 3.39, uh, 5.5 points uh, per 60. Uh, so the other companies with, uh, not too shabby here, uh, Sidney Crosby's first in 5.5 points uh, per 60 minutes among forwards uh, with 3.61. Joel Farabee is second with 3.39. Miko Rantanen is third with 3.38. Tim Stutzla fourth, thir- uh, 3.30. And um, Nathan McKinnon is fifth with 3.27. Um the lowest five uh, on five ice time per game besides Farabee is Crosby at 1445 this season. And Farabee, uh, his five on five ice time per game is 1245. So even though Farabee does have, um, I think it was, what did I say earlier? 15 um, something. Yeah, let me just find it here. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's, yeah, 15 minutes uh, and 12 seconds of time on ice per game. His five on five time on ice per game is only 1245. So, that just shows, right? Like he's in an upper echelon of players at the five on five realm right now where um, per 60 minutes, he's putting up, you know, 3.39 points. Um, and he's amongst guys like Crosby, Ranton and Stutzla McKinnon. So it obviously shows at five on five right now, he's creating a lot of offense and a limited amount of ice time, which is 12, uh, you know, minutes and 45 seconds um, on average per game at five on five right now. So I think it just begs the question, like you see a guy who is pretty young still like i think what Farabee's 23 years old right now yeah and he's only getting this limited ice time like why not give him a bigger chunk of the pie here and see if he can produce even more for you i mean obviously they're on a winning streak in the lineup management the ice time management it's all working but i just think there's a chance for you to get this guy more ice time and have him contribute even more um what yeah. do you think you're because I, I think he's playing less of the penalty kill right than he's ever than he's played with this team just because they have so many penalty killers and he's not playing the biggest role in the power play right now. I think really what it comes down to is that because him and Brink have had such good chemistry during the season, they don't really want to break them up. Like you can see they constantly put the two of them together and they really obviously like Forrester with Coots and TK and that line has done well. Um, I really do think they need to be more open to getting Farabee on that top line with Coots and Konechny to that's play more minutes. Yeah, like that that's the the top line for the Flyers, in my opinion. And I think they're kind of waiting on that and they want to keep the two rookies apart. But at the same time, like I would try Forrester with Brink. Like, I, why not? Like sometimes that has a way of working where you have kind of a young line, um, especially when they're playing on the third line together. It's not like Forrester's putting up a ton of numbers. Like maybe Brink can help him, you know, score a little bit more because he's a really good passer. I don't know. I I, I think Farabee is on the verge of a breakout. Like That's you what bring I mean. up, yeah, you bring up the numbers that you're talking about. Like this is a guy who uh, already kind of broke out. You know, took a little bit of step back because of his injuries. 
right? And then now he's, you know, he's like, he's a guy who potentially is going to be a point per game player in the NHL, the way that he plays. And the fact that he has six first goals for the team, I mean, he's coming out hot. I think he needs to be rewarded. Um, and I think 15, you know, 15 minutes a night, it's not bad for him. Like no. that's not something, but when he's playing like 12, you know, I'm like, okay, you're, he's not getting enough usage on the power play, right? Like you hear those Sidney Crosby, uh, ice time numbers. Well, he also is on the power play top power play for almost the entire time. And he goes on every power play, you know, and they're yeah. not using Farabee like that either. And again, well, that's the all these players is, on that list, right? right? Like Crosby's on the list. Rantanen's on the list. Stutz was exactly. on the list. McKinnon's on the list. They're all top power play guys for their team. I just think you look at Farabee uh, and that five uh, on five points per 60 metric, him being second amongst those guys with 3.39. Like it just speaks to the fact, Hey, this guy's producing at an elite level five on five. Why not give him that power play, you know, one um, time and kind of let him run with it and see if that makes your power play better because it's not like the power play is good right now and they're not giving him a lot well, of time. So they have mixed him in more, you know, they yeah, didn't even have lately, him on the power play at all. They have, but earlier, like you were saying, right. Yeah. They, they didn't even have him out there, which was kind of strange considering the power play hasn't been good. Yeah, so why we, not give it a I, shot again? Everyone is kind of getting screwed a little bit this year, not just frost. Like this team is a little bit overloaded with especially middle six forwards, you know, wingers specifically. Yeah. So like they're trying to balance these lines. Tortorella has brought it up himself that he feels like he has to get certain guys more time, but he kind of goes up with his gut during a game. I just think he needs to, he needs to throw a little more at Farabee because I think he's absolutely capable of it. And I think they're going to end up looking smart, um, especially when you see what he is doing on a regular basis. And I think putting him with Coots and TK is the perfect way of doing that, especially if you're not going to use him on the power play that much, just putting him on the top line alone. I have a feeling if they put that line together, it's, it's going to click. It, it's going to click. And moving Forrester to the third line to play with somebody like Paling or Cates, I actually really like the idea of uh, Forrester, Cates, Brink line. Uh, maybe help Cates get going, too. I, I wouldn't don't see mind Paling, that. Yeah, yeah I, I don't see Paling being a permanent maze to stay on the third line. Um, I think well, my that, thought process, I mean, Yuri, yeah, sorry to cut you off. But no, my thought fine. process, Yuriv, is um, you look at that top line of Konechny, um Katuri and Forster right now, and though they've been good, I think there's a chance for them to even finish at a higher rate. Like I think they've had some opportunities where it hasn't always clicked for them. And I think Forster, in a sense, though Agreed. he's playing though he's playing really well, um, just in terms of like the the little aspects, like he's he's one of the best four checkers on the team, in my opinion. Like mm-hmm. just the way he's on board battles, sticks on puck. He's always in like really good positioning to four check well and kind of create turnovers. So I think that's why they like him there. And he's with real like two of the best players on the team. So he's learning from them. So I think it's like a development thing too. Um, and then if he can get his scoring on track, it all kind of comes together. So that's why I think they've been trying him there for so long, but I think, you just have to um, reward Farabee here because, you know, 14 points in 18 games and he's only getting 1245 on average five on five ice time per game. Like if you gave him, let's say 15 minutes and up to three minutes, he probably would be almost a point of game guy. If you I had him so with too. Couturier and uh, Konechny as well. And another thing to add to that is Couturier and Farabee played pretty well, uh, actually really well together. A couple of years ago it was a Couturier JVR Farabee line. Uh, they had a lot of chemistry and were producing at a really high rate. And we've obviously seen Katuri and Konechny play well together in the past here. So I think you just have those three guys together. It could be a really, really strong uh, top line for you. And I think it doesn't hurt Forrester because you're still going to play him on the power play. And I do actually think the skill set of Bobby Brink um, kind of complements his well because you have the playmaker and the shooter together. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, if you want to keep the two rookies apart, you can always have, you know, an Atkinson drop down and move Brink up into his spot. Yeah. So there's oh, like that's great there's point. different ways to kind of put it together here if you don't want the two rookies to play. So I just think if you look at Farabee's production right now and kind of the other, you know, players that um he's in the same stratosphere with in terms of five on five points per sixty, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's just criminal not to have him play more at this point. I like the way you said that. So a couple more things I want to add. One, you know, on top of what you're saying, you know, Forrester is playing against the team's top pairing defenseman every That's night. That's what I He's mean. Playing, That's yeah. 
hurting yeah, him offensively. Right. Let's get him away from those guys. So, and if you guys don't remember when he put up seven points in eight games the previous year, he was not playing top six. He was playing third wow. line. Um, and then on top of that, I'll say this, right? Like, I think maybe it was, it might've been last episode. It, it might've been the last episode where Atkinson was playing on the top line with Forrester and Coots. And I, we were talking yeah. about it. I was like, I'd really like to see TK on that top line. I was like, I think that that needs to be the move they made. And then you saw Atkinson like start the game with them and then they immediately switched it to TK. So maybe this is another one of those things where they're thinking about it, right? And maybe that's going to be in the mix. And we might even see that if the team struggles to score, you know, right? It's hard uh, while we're talking about all these changes. It's hard to change things when you're winning, right? Like that's what I mean, a lot harder. Working. Yeah, it's working, right? So it's hard to, to make changes because you really just want to win as a coach. Yeah. But, and- you know, if they're, if they're, let, let me finish this thought. If they're getting stagnated by the Islanders, which I think the Islanders are capable of doing, maybe that's a move they switch to in the middle of the game. No, yeah, I totally agree. And I think if you look at it too, right, like the team's rolling. Um, so why are you going to make a ton of changes to the lineup? And you have to look at it from this way. Um, you put a line out there of, you know, Brink and Forrester together, two rookies, and let's say Cates or Paling, or whoever it ends up being, you know, that's not a line that you can stack up against every other line. Like you have two rookies out there. You have to kind of be um, cognizant of that. Whereas this setup that they have right now, I think it allows them to roll four lines more effectively and not um, get matchup chasing, kind of be afraid of, oh shit, like this line's out against the other team's top line, we're caught. Whereas like, you know, I don't think Tortorella has a problem with, oh, Ryan Paling and Joel Farabee are out against the other team's top lines, right? So this, the way they have it set up right now, I it's agree. more conducive to a deeper lineup. Well, I, that's what I like what you it, said, though. Yeah, About exactly. the Atkinson Brink. I'm sorry, yeah, you could, maybe that was what you were going to say. Yeah, exactly. So if you switch that around too, right, it becomes a lineup like that where maybe you could rotate a little bit more. So I think there's a reason for why they're keeping it the same because there's more flexibility in the sense that we don't have to worry about, okay, are we protecting our younger guys? Are we putting them in, you know, a disadvantageous situation? Whereas right now, you know, you have Forrester with two veterans. You know he's not going to be overwhelmed with those two guys on his line. You have Brink with two kind of vets in Paling and Farabee, and you know he's not going to get too overwhelmed on that line. So. Yeah. There's still, they're managing it in a smart way, but I still, you know, you love, I love what you were saying that about the matchups, but like, man, if we just, if they do play frost and you have like frost with, uh, with Tippett and Atkinson, right. And it's Lawton in the middle, right. Or maybe it's, I'm sorry, maybe they move Kate's back up and maybe it's Lawton or Kate's on the third line. Right. And then you take Delorier out for a game. I, again, I don't think they have to though. I think Delorier's played well. But, you know, you take him out. I, I still can't get over the idea of a, of a fourth line of paling Lawton and Hathaway. Like, that is a, that is a line that can score. Um, yeah. And then you have four scoring lines. And that that's a very difficult thing to stop as a coach because, because all four lines can score on you. I'm not saying they have to go that route. I get the point of a physical fourth line. Um, but I would like to see that. Or maybe even Kate's in the middle there, right? Kate's with paling and Hathaway. Um, there is also the option of moving Gates to wing, which has never been brought up, but he, he's more, off- uh, more offensive when he plays the wing. He played wing his whole career, but right. obviously they, they're set on developing him as a center right now. And I think, Torts, um, I think Torts loves him. I think he loves him. I think he loves Forrester. I think he loves TK. I think you can see that there is some favoritism on this team. Um, yeah. but I don't think it's not deserved either because as far as the little things that he talks about, the physicality and the ability to play defense and getting your stick in the way yeah. constantly, they are very good at that. Um, and it's why we have so many good penalty killers, right? But we have to point out too, like it's a different type of favoritism, right? It's not like Dave Hackstall throwing uh fucking Chris Vandeveld out there and Andrew McDonald, like right. these guys are having a positive impact. So I think there's a different way to look at it. Like think about it this way, right? the Flyers are playing well. These guys that he's overutilizing in certain senses, maybe um, in comparison to other players, it's not like they're not having positive impacts on the game and on the, on the team at this moment. So yeah. I, if it wasn't working and the team was losing and you're still seeing the same lineup trotted out there every single night, then I understand, you know, the outrage, but I just think with a winning lineup, I mean, there might be certain guys and certain kind of, um, 
variations we like to see. And we even went over it ourselves, right? Like we want to see Joel Fair be used more, but I can't actively look at the team and the lineup and say and pinpoint and critique and be like, well, they have no idea what they're doing. I mean, they've won five games in a row, so you have to give credit where credit is due. Right. Well said. So let's get let's get into the next topic, and this is another one that you came up with, which uh, I think is a conversation we need to have, even though it's very early. But I know a lot of people expect him to leave town quite quickly. Um, and, and again, that might happen still, uh, but I don't think so. And I, I would imagine you don't either, just because when you find a guy who really fits, who's not old, who can be here for a little bit, who you can re-sign and then potentially move even still. Like, I don't think he's a guy who's going to, his value is going to completely disappear. And I think it proves that he was not a throw-in in this trade, that the throw-in was Pedersen and that the value back was Walker, a first and Grands for Provorov. Um, I, I think Sean Walker, should he get extended? I'll let you answer that first, but I kind of answered it for both of us. Um, In my opinion, Yes, just based on the merit of play, uh, because he's playing like a bona fide number four defenseman right now. Mm -hmm. And this team needs top four defensemen, because if you look at the structure right now, they're only legitimate ones that you could point to other than Walker is um, Sandheim and York, right? Um, no matter how well Nick Steeler's playing, he's not a top four defenseman in this league. He's a really solid uh, third pairing option. They obviously have Razzis versus the line, who's a top four guy. But having, you know, four guys that can play in a role that isn't above where they actually should be is a good thing. Um, and it helps your team's overall success. So it, when I look at it from just uh, simply uh, on ice, how's the guy playing? You know, how's he been contributing? How's he been impacting the team after being a new addition? Um, I don't think you can, can complain in any respect, right? He's exceeded expectations all the way around. Um, he has 10 points already in 18 games this season. Um, in 70 games last season with the Kings, he had 13 points. So he's only three away from breaking that. And he already tied his three goals uh, of last season. The most points Sean Walker's ever scored in his career is in 2019-20 uh, with the LA Kings. In 70 games, he had 24 points. And he's on pace to smash that. So just overall at the production, right? Like, he definitely is a guy that you should look to re-sign. The caveat as to why you might want, not want to do that is uh, he is a right-shot defenseman. That's a defenseman that um, is going to be really overvalued in the current day NHL. Just is what it is. That skill set, being able to you know produce offense from that position on the right side, it's something that teams will overpay for. So you have to think him and his agent are, th are looking at it like, well, you hit the free agent market, and maybe somebody's going to give you one of the best contracts you'll ever potentially see versus resigning with the Flyers. So I think that's something they have to kind of take into consideration. Um, but you also have to look at it too as Walker's never played this well before. Right. Um, even just, even yeah. when yeah, even when he was on the Kings, right? Like he was a top four option for them at a point, but he still never played this well um, in in the sense of okay, he's producing this much offensively. He's also having this much of an impact on the game um, on you know a night to night basis here. So maybe he himself looks at it and says, well. I've played the best I ever have with the Flyers. Maybe I want to stay with this team and stay with this coach because obviously he's unlocking something in my game that I wasn't able to do previously. But who knows? At the end of the day, um, it's a business and it's all about money. So for him to want to go to free agency and potentially cash in, I can't really blame the player on that. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the Flyers do because if he continues to play this way, and the way teams overpay at the trade deadline, you might be able to get a first round pick for him just because he's a right handed shot, you know, playing almost 20 minutes a night on average, I believe, right now. Yeah. So, all those factors, and you're like, well, what can I get for him, you know, on the open market here? Yeah, his, his average time on ice right now is 2105 and going so, like, up. He's, and going up. Yeah. So, he's literally playing a bona fide top four role and, you know, producing offensively almost every night here just with the fact that he, um, has you know 10 points in 18 games so i think for the flyers they would like to probably re-sign him just because it adds another element to their defense i don't think they thought or knew that maybe walker was gonna be able to play up to this potential and play this well so it almost speeds things up in a sense that okay well we have santa we have walker we have york we can really add one 
you know, top tier echelon number one defenseman down the line here, and maybe our defense is set for a couple of years going ahead. So it almost kind of saves you from having to look for another top four guy if you have him in Walker. Um, but I do and uh, can see a scenario where the player wants to cash in in free agency and maybe get a long term deal where the Flyers might not be so willing to do that, just looking at his age and the fact that they're looking to get younger guys into the lineup down the line uh, with yeah. Bach and even some other options like Andre and, and Ronnie Adder that are in the minors here. So what do you think about it, Yuri? Yeah, I mean, look, you encompass it all there. Um, I think if a first-round pick is on the table, you have to consider it, right? Because you've I think never this done is, this before, right? Right. So. Well, I also think, for the as far as first-round pick, I think that that is doable. As far as going on the open market and getting some kind of huge contracts, I don't know because, again, he's never done it before, and I, I don't think that a player typically at that age who's kind of gone up and down his career and really looking for stability i don't think he's going to run away from the success that he found here i think again just like he's going to want to he's going to want to he's not going to get that much more money and um he's going to want to be where he is successful we do have to recognize that risto has not played he is taking some of risto's minutes too right now that doesn't mean his minutes will drop when risto gets here i don't know what's going to happen and risto has to kind of work he hasn't played in a while so he's got to work his way back in the lineup anyway risto might be an option to move if anything you know he just has a longer term on his contract but i i think they have to wait you know i think and see yeah. We, yeah i think you have to let it let it play out probably until the trade deadline see where your team is i think if the flyers are in a bubble position they might not do anything and just be like, well, let's, you know, if they're in a playoff spot, they're going to be like, well, being in the playoffs is worth it for us. But if they're a little bit outside of the playoffs and somebody's offering them a first round pick for him or a high second, I think they have to consider it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I agree. You, you have to consider it um, because he's not a guy who's completely irreplaceable. Right. Like he's not a guy who you'll never find another defenseman of this quality again. Right. But if he's working and you got to talk to him, right, you have to see what kind of deal is he looking for? Is he looking for a five year, four million dollar year contract? Well, you're not going to get that from us. Right. That's not going to happen. Right. So if he's looking for something like that, then it's a no brainer. You move him. Right. Unless you're in a playoff spot and you want to keep your core and you think you might be able to do, you know, maybe get to the second round, earn, earn your organization some money, get yourself some extended playoff time for your players. That's worth the investment. But Again, if you're kind of in that middling range, you're not sure if you're going to make the playoffs and somebody offers you something real nice. And I think you said it really well that, you know, just his overall value, what he's doing this year, if he continues what he's doing, um, there's real value there um, in yeah, a trade. Um, might never be higher. So, yeah, may maybe it may be more than every other player who we would consider trading, um, like realistically consider trading, not like Carter Hart trade. I mean, yeah. Like, like real trade, like Atkinson's in that mix. Um, I think and um, Walker's in that mix, right? I think I, I or you totally hit the nail on the head, Yuri. I mean, like it's really dependent on what the player wants and where the Flyers are at at the trade deadline. I don't think yeah. if you're, you know, uh, more than five to eight points out of the playoffs here, you're going to want to miss out on the asset that he could get back uh, for then your you have team. Three potentially three first round picks. That's a great and then way you to can, move up. You can really do anything at that point and right. move up into any spot, maybe even like top five, top 10, even if you don't finish there. So I think it just adds to the flexibility of your team and what you can kind of do in this rebuilding phase to even become more competitive quicker. So I and think this is why you want to win games. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because you can use an asset like this to potentially add even more um, in terms of draft capital. Whereas if the team's shit, like he's probably not playing that well and you're probably not trading him for a first right. round pick anyway. But if he continues it, we've seen it happen in the past. Teams always overpay for right-handed defensemen. It just is what it is in this league. But I think you have to really gauge it, right? Like if the right. Flyers are in a playoff so position, yeah, if the Flyers are in a playoff position, like wild card spot, or they're one or two points back, I don't expect him to get traded. I assume they'll try to maybe extend him. 
but it all depends on what he's looking for. Like you said, right? I think if it's anything over a three year term, I don't think the Flyers will be interested in that. No, I agree. Um, but if it's a three years or lower and it's at a decent type of cap hit where you're paying four million, you know, maybe that sweet spot is three point five to four million because he has never had a season like this before. You're not gonna pay him substantial substantially. But if he thinks to himself, well, you know what? And box at that and says, I can go to free agency and get five million a year. Well, well ba- I would, ba- based I would off of say his, at this point, go ahead, right? Based off his last year, he wouldn't have got anything close to that. He probably would have saw less money, actually. Yeah. So I, I think it's possible to get him at three for three for three. Three million again, if he's happy here, which it seems like he is. Um, yeah. I think you can get a little bit of a discount on them and negotiate tough and be like, look, if you don't want to re-sign for that number, we're rebuilding, right? So We'll move on from you and yeah. we'll wish you the best of luck because we have other guys that can play minutes. We, and then we want to work in. Yeah. You see, we can throw in defensemen and they'll do well. You can you can negotiate from a position of power. We'll be like, look, we have next man up mentality. We have Oliver Bond coming, right? We have Rasmus Ristolainen. We have Emil Andre, right? We have Igor Zamula. You know, we wish you the best and thank you for the asset and we'll, you know, we'll plan forward. Right. But it all depends on where the flyers are. And I think this is why I don't like the, oh, you're rebuilding, do this thing, because that's not real. You just evaluate things as you move forward. And like Facility said really well earlier in this episode, right, you have to look at all avenues available for you and what is the best thing at, at, at the time. And we know that Briere is not scared to move guys. Right. And and Walker, while playing very well, he is not completely irreplaceable. It's not like you'll never find another Sean Walker. Right. If anything, you can no. be like, well, let's move Walker, keep that cap space. Well, Maybe we can find somebody even better. If Emil Andre comes up and hits and projects to be what he can be, he basically is almost like a Sean Walker, really aggressive, offensive, sneaking type of defenseman, right hand shot. You know, it all it all kind of plays in. But like I said, I, I think it's just a wait and see. And we always see see this in the past with defensemen, especially in the free agent market. There will be one team out there that will pay him like five million a year. Like it just happens that way, unfortunately. I, it might, especially with the fact the cap is going to go up. It's yeah, it's possible. But you got to be tough. I like what the Carolina Hurricanes do. Like they negotiate tough, right? And they've been competitive yep. for a while. You have to be that way. If a guy goes above your limit, that was the mistake with the Rasmus Ristolainen. and you had to be a little tougher in that negotiation, which Fletcher was not good at. And I don't think he's severely overpaid, but I would say he's maybe a million dollars a year overpaid, right? Like you, you probably could have got him cheaper than what you actually paid for him. You know what you're actually paying him a year. It would have been easier to move too. So you have to consider that, especially in this phase where the team is and you're not really adding, you have to be a tough negotiator and you have to be able to move on from players who want serious money because you're not going to give it to them, right? You're going to have young guys you need to resign. You have Carter Hart you need to resign. So I think at the end of the day, if he wants to negotiate tough, he moves on. Um, if he's happy here and he wants to take a team friendly contract, I think we'll be having conversations about resigning him. And if he is still playing the way he's playing, I mean, the, I don't think it's too late for a guy to finally find his home and finally become a top four defenseman. So I, lo- I, defenseman I love that. always bloom late uh, and it can happen with a lot of players. So I wouldn't be surprised if he stays here for the next couple seasons and continues this type of yeah. solid play. And and we also wouldn't be surprised if he gets moved at the trade deadline. But again, we'll see 50, where this 50, team is. I would say. Yeah, we'll see where this team is. If the Flyers go in and beat the Islanders, you know, and uh, again, Tortorella has a history of taking his teams on streaks and look at the Columbus Blue Jackets. Since they got rid of him, they have... Yeah. They have not done as well. well one Ford. trend, I mean, actually, before we kind of get into our phantoms and prospect talk, just in general, like about Tortorella teams, typically the second, the first year he takes over, that team will always miss the playoffs. In his second year, though, yeah, they typically. always make the playoffs Yeah, in every single tenure that he's been in. So, I mean, if the trend continues, we will see here, but that's something to kind of point out, I would say. Yes, with a young team, that is a good thing. If you were taking a young squad and making the playoffs and you turn Travis Sanheim into, into a lead defenseman, you do things are going in the right direction. Yes. If this would have happened last season, people wouldn't be screaming for a rebuild. Yeah, something to learn from. Um I think too, this next kind of stretch coming up here is gonna be really telling. Um what is it? They're playing the Islanders. Um is it uh, the Rangers on Friday and then the Islanders again? Um, and then I believe Carolina after that and then the Devils. So 
They um, have um, a lot of divisional matchups coming up, and then the Penguins after that. Back to yeah, back games. Against yeah, the so I I even forgot about that. So pretty much their whole slate coming up is in division matchups. So you know if they have a winning record against their own division coming up here in this stretch, it's looking pretty good for them just in terms of where they're sit- going to be sitting in the standings because these are going to all be four point games. So you're yeah. either losing four points or really gaining four points. So it, I'm going to be, be really interested telling. to see. Yeah. Yeah, and if they don't do well on this road trip, we'll be having different conversations, right? And again, we're open to both right now, but you'll have to play things differently as this team moves forward. And I think until we get to like, you know, before that trade deadline talk, we won't really know what this team is going to do. It's really about that, you know, where the team is around the trade deadline. That's what's going to matter. Um, not the, you know, the first twenty games tell us something, but it's not going to tell us the whole story, and it's not going to fill in all the decisions that need to be made. It's just, it's yeah. not possible and it wouldn't be wise to even uh, see that way. Unless, you know, let's just say somebody goes, Hey, we want to give you a, a, like a, a team. That's not even that great. Wants to give you a first round pick for Scott, uh, for Sean Walker. Now. I mean, you might consider it, right? Uh, um, yeah. You had your bets, right? Because who knows if he's going to continue this. So. Right. Exactly. So, but I don't think it's going to happen. That shit doesn't usually happen. Because teams aren't going to invest in something unless they know they're going to the playoffs. Too. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, it, yeah, it's the same for every team around the league. All right. Uh, so just want to remind everybody, please, to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell for notifications. And uh, follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Um, and if you can give us a rating on iTunes, that would be awesome. All right. Let's get into our last couple segments here. This will be shorter than the rest. Uh, so Phantoms update. So Phantoms had a couple big wins. Uh, they beat the Laval Rockets 3-2, and then they had a huge victory, and I had the team up here, and I forgot to write it down. Uh, who was it? I'm sorry. Oh, the Belleville Senators. They spanked them uh, in an 8-1 victory, uh, where pretty much 15 players on in the lineup had points. Uh, just going through, Tanner Lezinski had two goals, and Milan Andre found, uh, scored another goal. Um Ronnie Adderd had two goals, one assist. J.R. Avon had two assists in that one. Wade Allison scored. Cooper Marudi scored. Sammy Tuomalo had a goal and assist. Uli Lickshell uh, has two assists. And again, the top line there is uh, Tuomalo, Lickshell, and Lazinski. Lazinski also won uh, AHL Player of the Week. Um, he's been red hot. Uh, that top line also dominated the game before. Sammy Tuomala is crushing it. He is definitely one of the best rookies uh, in the AHL right now. I was looking at kind of the overall standings. He's in that um, top 10, top 10 range, I think, maybe top 15 range in points per game. So he's really, really doing a nice job. Uh, as we're recording this, they're playing the Marlies. Uh, it's on the NHL network. Um, so just everybody should be aware of that one. Um, but yeah, so we were talking last week about how the team was struggling to score. Things are starting to turn around for them. They had a Eight big goals against night. Belleville. Yeah. Huge. They spanked them. Um, and Parker Gahagan played really well. I mean, he had 33 saves, so it's not like they weren't tested at all, or I'm sorry, he had 32 saves on 33 shots. So, uh, again, their goal had, uh, held up and their offense just really took off. Ronnie Adderd, uh, obviously having his biggest game. Um, maybe that can get him going. Um, but a lot of young guys putting up putting up numbers there. Zabe Wisdom still hasn't really produced at all, um, so I don't know where he's going to be uh, with the organization. You know, he might be a guy the Flyers consider moving on from, honestly, for a pick. They have a uh, lot just, of young guys coming in. Plus yeah, and, you have another draft crop this year. So, and he's he's struggled to kind of find his place here. So, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what will happen, but um, Victor Mete also was a plus three that game with an assist. Um, and yeah, the Phantoms are heading in the right direction. Um, they now have a winning record. They're moving up in their division. Uh, so what do you, what do you think about the Phantoms? You want to add anything? Yeah, just, I think obviously it's good to see them get on the winning track and just begin to score. I mean, we knew they had a lot more depth, uh, than, you know, kind of prior matchups were showing. Just if you look at the stat line, the score line, they weren't really scoring a lot of goals. Um, and I think with the forward depth that they do have, they should be a team that can beat you in terms of like outscoring you, uh, be able to produce offensively, um, especially with guys like Lazinski and Allison and Cooper uh, Maruti, who are older players, but also um, should be guys that are, you know, almost point of game or such in the AHL. It's really... Um, 
great though, obviously, to see Tuamala uh, just have kind of a red hot week and just put up a lot of points. I mean, he's a guy that stood out to us in the development camp and in the preseason. So it's good to see him kind of continue that. Um, and then also, I think uh, seeing the defense kind of get things on track. Um, Cause obviously if you look at Adder, you look at Andre, um, they were guys that were struggling a bit at the AHL level. Uh, so to see them kind of, contribute in these wins is a really good thing uh, for their development too. I think though, if you look at the fans in general and just the way the flyers lineups kind of playing out, who knows if there'll be injuries on the line, but I wouldn't expect really anybody on the fans right now to be called up um, just down the line and kind of in the immediate future, unless there are injuries, of course, but I just think the way the flyers are rolling and the fact that they have guys in the NHL roster, they can't even get into the lineup right now. I think they're going to let a lot of these younger guys that are still in the AHL kind of continue to cook and just develop um, at that level. Yeah, I think so too. And Elliot Denoye, uh is injured right now. So for the, that's why I didn't mention is why I um, didn't mention any point production though. He was doing a lot better offensively of late. Um, so he's a guy who's out and uh, they're still rolling. I agree with you. Obviously. I don't see any call-ups. The only one I, I could see potentially, um, and this would have to be multiple injuries for the Flyers again, like, Frost is not going to be benched for a guy in the AHL. Uh, but Samu Tuomala is a guy I think they might want to give a little bit of taste to the NHL because we know that Tortorella loved him. Yeah. Um, and he's doing very well in the AHL, again, playing top line uh, as a 20-year-old. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, but I, I agree with you. I don't see any of that happening, and I don't even see Lazinski getting called up um, just because I know Torts is not, like, enamored with Lazinski, and I already expected him to be one of the best AHL players, a guy like Wade Allison is a guy who really needs to build on a lot because he only has, I think two or three goals. I think he has three goals uh, down there in the minors. So, or maybe he's even two, so not good enough, um, but we'll see what happens. Um, and especially as the Flyers defense is getting healthy now, I just, I can't see it. If anything, I think there might be a chance that Belpedio might get sent down. Um, and I guess a quick update that Sandstrom seems to be healthy. Now he was waived. Uh, he'll probably start playing games with the Phantoms. Uh, Gahagan has been playing well. Pedersen has been playing better. We saw him have a good game with the Flyers. So they're pretty deep at goaltender down there with That's three a good guys. thing, though, Yeah, for Sandstrom yeah. to actually get to play games. Like before, the guy feel for the guy, right? Like you're a hockey player, you're a goalie. The worst thing you can really do for your game as a goalie is to never play because, you know, it's a position that is kind of incumbent on you you know, feeling pucks, getting to make saves, getting into a rhythm. He just has not played a lot. Like, he literally played zero periods for the Flyers, gets sent down for a conditioning stint to play and kind of get some of his legs under him and then gets injured pretty much immediately. So yeah, first period. Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully the guy can just get in like five, six, seven games here in a row and kind of get a rhythm because – it's just tough for him as a human being in a situation where you're a professional athlete who's not playing any games at all. Um, yeah. So good, good for him to get some games in for sure. Yeah. Well said. Um, all right, let's get into our prospect updates. Uh, I'm just going to read off some players stats, but I do want to, let's just start off with cutter Gautier. Uh So Gautier in 12 games, got 11 goals and four assists. Uh, I mean, he is a goal scoring machine. There's nobody on his team. who's even close to that type of goal scoring production. Uh, he's starting to put up assists as well. Uh, his production is going up. Um, he's definitely going to double what he did last season, especially because he has more talent with his team. But this yeah. is exactly the type of player the Flyers need, a guy who is most likely a bona fide 40-goal scorer at the NHL level. Um, it's just really good to see. I mean, 11 goals in 12 games, that is not that is no joke at the NCAA level uh, to do at 19 years old. So what do you think about um, our boy uh, Cutter? Oh, he's doing a great job. I mean, like you said, almost a goal a game pace. There's not really much more you can ask for at this point. I think he's going to continue on that pace. If you watch just some of the clips um, and highlights of some of his goal scoring, the goals and where he's scoring from on the ice, like it just seems like he's a dominant player at that level right now. Like he's skating um, really quickly for a big guy. Like that's my most kind of uh, impressive thing with him when I do see him is that. For a guy who's pretty big, um, he's able to really like take a lot of um, steps in his stride and move quickly across the ice. And for a big guy, that's a really um, important asset to his game. Obviously, the release on his shot is just insane. Like if you look at most of his goals, he's beating goalies from distance. 
um, you know, that's beyond the circles and the hash marks as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if that eventually translates. Like obviously NHL goalies are better than NCAA goalies. Who knows if you can still beat them from that distance. But if you look at the velocity behind a shot, I will, ex- I expect it to continue at, at the NHL level as well. I think he has an NHL ready caliber shot. And you look at his production in the world championships against men and guys who played in the NHL kind of speaks to that. Um, and I don't then, think I don't think he plays unless it's this season. I don't think he plays in the minors at ever. all next year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I agree. Sorry, did you did I cut you off for something? No, no, cutter? good to go. Okay. Yeah. Um. So just uh, Mitchkov hasn't really played since then. Um, yeah, he's sick, I believe. Uh, yeah, he's, he's been sick. Yeah, it's the second time he's gotten sick. Uh, again, his numbers are still outrageous. I mean, um. Uh, Vasily brought it up earlier. He in 25 games with Sochi has 24 points, 11 goals, 13 assists. Uh, I was looking at it earlier with that 0.96 that puts him somewhere around uh, points per game. Uh, and that's in the 25 games for Sochi. If he didn't play that one game for Ska, that would put him in like top 12 in scoring points per game in the KHL. Every single player on that list outside of one guy is 27 and up. Uh <laughs> No yeah. guy his age is doing that. So just perspective for you guys. This is this is an incredibly special player. Uh, I don't see it not translating to the NHL. I he's not even on a good team. Uh I, I think honestly he probably should have produced even more. Uh if he played on a better team, he might be in the he top five in Scott. scoring. Yeah. Which again, if you look at Ovechkin's past, he played with a better team. Um, and some of the other guys played with better teams. This is probably why he wasn't very happy to go to uh Sochi and why he wanted to go to Dynamo, or I, I think he had a, a thought that he wanted to go to another team, right? Yeah. Um, so he knows that. Um, but this is a generational pace right now. We're gonna have Steve Cornianos, I mentioned it earlier, on here, and I'm sure he's going to echo that and um, break and, it down. And yeah. he's gonna break it down for us. And you guys, you know, you'll hear a little bit more, but you know, if you watch this guy at all. Uh, there are plays of him where he, how the hell does he not get a point? Um, or how does he not get a goal? Or he'll his make hockey new- sense, man, is off it's the just, charts. It's not even the everything about him. It's not even the skills in terms of like puck. Okay, obviously this guy's puck handling is dynamic. His shooting is dynamic in terms of the release. Um, he's really good skater. Also, a guy that's competing out there. Like he's not one of those top tier level draft picks that. Okay, he has all the skills, so his competes lacking. It's actually the opposite. It looks like to me, he has a high motor, uh, especially yeah. for his size. Um, but yeah, it's the hockey sense is just above that all to me. I just feel like whenever I'm watching some of these KHL games, because I'll, I'll catch them from time to time and just seeing Mitchkov play, he just has that innate sense to know where to be on the ice and also to kind of assess where the play is going. Where if you look at all the best players in the league, and this is over the last 20, 30 years, uh, and you could date it back even further than that, all the best players in the NHL and the guys that are going to contribute on a daily and nightly basis. Um, are guys that are able to kind of read the play, anticipate the play, find those soft spots of open ice and know where to be. And that's all things that I see within his game at a young age, at a pro level nonetheless. So, and, yeah, just, oh, it's just amazing, man, just what he's doing right now. I, and I think he's a better shooter than Cutter Gauthier. You know, for how amazing of a shooter Cutter Gauthier is, I'm pretty sure Mitchkov is a lot better. I think Mitchkov's shot's more accurate, um, whereas Gauthier might have more of the power behind he's it. He's much and bigger. kind of... You trade that, I guess, for both of them, right? But, but that that's for now, you know? Exactly. I, when I look at what Bedard is doing, and he is fantastic at the NHL level Killing right now, it, yeah. I, I see no reason why Mitch Kov can couldn't be doing the same thing right now. And I'm kind of happy that he's not here. Um, I like that he's being seasoned. And yeah, if he was here, it'd probably speed stuff up. But to allow him to develop and to come over here as a developed hockey player you know more physically mature and being you know closer to adult age you know not just being 18 19 years old um same thing with cutter like i like that cutter took the extra year i know we want him here um but at the same time it's better that he comes in more mature because they're gonna have to deal with you know being a professional here and i think mitch Kive is already in a professional environment playing with men um and we saw cutter like facility brought it up cutter playing amongst men it's not only did he not look, you know, out of place, he looked like maybe the best player on the team. So um, I think both of these guys are really, really, really special. Um, and I'm super excited. I mean, I, I could see Cutter being as big of an impact as Jeff Carter. 
uh, maybe something even more potentially. Uh, and then Mitch Cobb might end up being one of the best flyers of all time if he continues his trajectory. Um, you know, he could be a guy we're talking about as an all time great. Because uh, again, what he's doing is absolutely Unseen. insane. Yeah. Yes, it's absolutely insane. Um, so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll keep talking about him the whole time. And a couple more updates. Hunter McDonald still has not played more than one game. I don't know what's going on with him. I can't find anything online. Um, if anybody has an update on Hunter McDonald, you know, leave it in the comments or reach out to us. I don't know what's going on. I assume he's got an injury, but he's only played one game. Um, Denver Barkey's got 28 points in 21 games. He cooled down a little bit, but again, still very good. Uh, production there. Massimo Rizzo's got 20 points in 12 games. He also cooled down, um, but also still doing really well. He's trying to earn an ELC. We'll see if he gets one. I suspect he might. Um, you know, remember he is older. He's 22 years old playing in NCAA. So even though he's, his numbers are very high, um, he's a lot older than uh, the players around him. So, or not a lot, but you know, he's got, he's got, experience beyond a lot of those guys so it's not crazy to see his numbers that high ryan mcpherson uh put, i think he had two goals the other night in the bchl he has uh eight goals 14 assists 22 points in 19 games which is very good but he'll have to obviously take take his game up in another league next year to see if he can continue that owen mcclellan has 11 points in 11 games in the ncaa that is pretty good um he's a guy who will we'll probably see with the phantom soon uh, who else? Uh, Oliver Bonk got 19 points in 21 games. He had a couple goals the other night. Um, he's now got three goals, 16 assists, 19 points. Um, very good. And I think that's pretty much Devin Kaplan's got nine points in 12 games. Alex Bump, uh, seven points in 10 games. He started off pretty slow. Um, so it looks like his production is going up uh, as well since he moved over to the NCAA, uh, Western Michigan Un University. Western Michigan University. Uh, so good to see there. Uh, Carter Southern, uh, he had a couple goals the other night. Uh, WHL, he has, as a defenseman, he's got 11 points in 17 games, which is pretty damn good uh, for a draft plus one. So we'll have to see if he, you know, can keep that up. Alex sierra got four goals, seven assists, 11 points in 17 games. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, do you want to read out the goalies? I don't know if there's much to update there, but um, um, no, I think I think we're good to go. I don't have too much okay. to update for the goaltenders. Yeah, the goalies. I will say, um, uh, Zavargan, Zavargin. How do you say? How do you say it again? Zavragan. Zavragan. That's it. Thank you. I always have trouble saying his name for some reason, even though I've said it like a thousand times. He did uh earn another win. He is 6-1-2 and two in the MHL, 1.63 goals against the average, and a .945 save percentage, which is insane. Uh, we'll see if that yeah. balances out. Kolsov uh, does have a couple. He's been losing of late. Again, he's not on a great team, um, but 2.35 goals against the average and a .907 save percentage. Those numbers have definitely gone down since the beginning of the year, but I don't doubt in his skill set. And I did men I did want to mention Matei Tomek, who is a forgotten player. He's a little bit older at this point, but a guy whose career was kind of falling apart. But he is doing well in the Czechia League. I mean, a .75 goals against average, but a .911 uh, save percentage. He's twelve and four. Uh, he's got a twelve and four record. Yeah, Flyer still hold his rights if he was ever yeah. to come back. So and uh, Carson Bjarnason. 3.15 goals against average. Uh, he is 7-5-3, and three, so he's got a winning record with a .906 save percentage. So not too bad. All right. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, Vasily, anything you want to add here at the end? Yeah, so the Flyers, uh, they're going to be hitting their 20-game mark. Um, so I was planning to have an article out actually last week, kind of dissecting the team's play overall, but I think... It was better to wait till they hit the 20 games uh, and use that whole full 20 game sample size to kind of put my article together here. So I'm going to have something this weekend uh, on flyersnittygritty.com uh, just regarding that, the 20 game sample size and uh, how typically a 20 game sample size is something you can look at and um, kind of pin an identity on a team using that. Whereas anything lower, it can be something where it's almost a mirage. Uh, and we've seen that in the past. So 
Um, it'll be interesting to see how the Flyers finish out um, the 20 games here. But so far, I mean, they're looking like a team um, that has a whole different identity from the past couple of seasons, and it's, it's welcomed. Uh, and another thing, too, to keep an eye on is uh, Jamie Baskow, you know, does it all for Flyers Nitty Gritty. He's actually going to have some interviews coming up, a uh, dual interview with um, Oliver Bonk and uh, Denver Barkey of the London Knights. So keep an eye out for the, uh, that interview. It's going to be a really fun one. Um, and Jamie always does a great job with that stuff. Yes, he does. He's a savage. I love the way he operates. <laughs> all right. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for listening. Just a reminder, please like, subscribe. Uh, hit the notification bell, uh, follow us on iTunes and Spotify, give us a rating on iTunes. All of that is extremely, extremely helpful. We are humbled by the attention that we get, uh, and we love it, and we're not going to stop, obviously, at all. We're going to keep this going. And again, shout out to our sponsor, Jim Steaks of 4th and South. And remember, you can get their cheese steaks at DoorDash. All right, that's it for us. Hopefully the Flyers win um, when you guys listen to this and continue the streak going. And, uh, yeah, we love you. And remember, always stay gritty.